Euromax highlights in this edition. Unusual perspectives, the world through the eyes of German artist Christoph Bresch. Spring sensation, it's almond blossom time on the Spanish island of Mallorca. Design innovator, Dutch designer Richard Hutten's playful creations. Euromax highlights and here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Greetings from Berlin and welcome to our Highlights Edition. And we're starting off in jolly old England, where local pub culture is world famous, but typical pub food does often leave much to be desired. Which is why it's all the more surprising that the good old Michelin Guide keeps finding pubs that impress to the point of earning one of its coveted stars. Well, this year there are a record 10 English pubs that sport a Michelin star, and we paid a visit to the place that got the ball rolling. The small village of Harem in the northern English county of Yorkshire is famous for its Star Inn pub. As well as the regulars, it has also attracted celebrities and royalty. Actors such as Daniel Craig, Judi Dench and Michael Caine, and even Princess Anne and the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, have visited the Michelin-starred pub. Head chef and owner Andrew Pern took over the Star Inn 14 years ago and hit upon the idea of offering upscale food. Many were skeptical. The Star Inn, you've got the best of all worlds. So you can have the nice food, uh, you've got the nice uh, ambience and whatever, um, and atmosphere. The, the English and the British people are very much uh, more relaxed in, in this area. So you can come and read the newspaper if you want and have a chat to the locals, which are people in the village come at, you know, traditionally after finished work. The food at the Star Inn is typically English, with a seasonal and regional flavor. Andrew Pern buys his ingredients locally. For example, ducks from his neighbor Paul Talling. Michelin inspectors place great importance on locally sourced products when grading pubs. Andrew Pern is a professional chef. His menu features dishes such as boiled duck's eggs or mushrooms with hazelnut pesto. He's proud of his success. We're up to, I think, now 10 Michelin-starred pubs in, in England. Uh, being one of the first ones is, is very nice. Uh, people tend to follow what we've done, which is very pleasing. It's quite an accolade in itself that people within the trade uh, aspire to be like us, which, you know, who am I to say? But what I do, I enjoy, and I put on the menu what I like to eat, and, you know, the surroundings are what we like. So it's very, uh, very pleasing and uh, nice to be part of the whole Michelin uh, sort of the guide and be an ambassador, if you like, for our region of, of what we're doing, you know, within the north, north of England. 380 kilometers further south is the Harwood Arms. This year it became London's only pub to boast a Michelin star. As well as the food, the testers also look for a pub that is rich in traditional atmosphere. The secret of good pub food is creating great dishes from simple ingredients. Derek Brown is the former head of the Michelin Guide. The creativity of the chef is important at this level as it is at any level. And therefore, a pub must have somebody who can really understands how to cook. Because sometimes cooking the more simple products is, is, is not as easy as, as people think. Pubs are a great testing ground for up-and-coming chefs. Stephen Williams, who is in charge of the kitchen at the Harwood Arms, is only 27. The Michelin star came as a big surprise to him. So it may be gone five more minutes. We did never set out to get a Michelin star. The most important thing is that people enjoy the place, uh, like the food, um, and that it, it, it's busy and, you know, we're, we're serving good food. Um, we're enormously proud of achieving it, and I'm enormously proud of the small team that we have here. But it was a huge shock, <laughs> a huge, huge shock. The food prices in this pub range from 3 to 19 euros. That's reasonable for London. It is booked solid for the next two months. But anyone lucky enough to get a table can enjoy a relaxed atmosphere. There's no time restraints, there's no pressures, and um, you can just relax, talk as long as you want, and um, enjoy yourself. Back at the Star Inn, they've long got used to the Michelin accolade. 
Andrew Pern is already looking to the future and perhaps a second star. Hmm. Well, now that we've been fortified with some fine pub grub, it's time to take a look at the world through the eyes of artist Christoph Brech, based in Munich. He's one of Germany's best in the field of video art, and you can always count on him to find a new take on everyday objects or routines. The Villa Stuck Museum in Munich is currently hosting a comprehensive exhibition of his work, and it's a show that certainly challenges our perceptions. A rather unconventional view of Rome, captured on video by a camera attached to the rear of a car while driving through the streets of the Italian capital. And this is in fact the vestibule of a church. Welcome to the world as seen by innovative German artist Christoph Brech. A world as if through a looking glass. When I'm walking, I'll see something and I don't need to make any changes. I just focus on it with my camera. I just make something visible that's already there. Brech's recurring themes include life, death and the passage of time. His video, Death and the Maiden, was recorded using four cameras. These were focused on the French foursome Cator Ebene as they performed the Franz Schubert string quartet that gave the video its name. Other Brecht projections comprise footage of landscapes in Canada and Italy. His video work, Upstream 2, depicts the St. Lawrence River in Canada, with the camera this time mounted on a boat. Christoph Brech is an artist who has a special talent for composing images. What he also does is shape the time and space that appear in the images. Christoph Brech lives and works in Munich. He originally became a professional gardener before deciding to study painting at the age of 25. He later specialized in photographic and video art. The world has gotten so loud. You find yourself bombarded by noise and all the traffic. Then you discover a place that, despite being in the maelstrom of the hustle and bustle, has something serene and secretive about it. I love the golden thread on the one hand. Reich has captured images across the world, like here on the Campo de Fiori in Rome. It was while studying at the Villa Massimo Academy here in 2006 that he compiled a collection of images from everyday life in Rome. The book proved so popular that he even earned an audience with the Pope. 260 artists, including architect Zaha Hadid, film director Nani Moretti, and Christoph Brech were invited. He kept his own artistic record of this once-in-a-lifetime encounter. And the resulting photos are also on show at the Munich exhibition. With the Pope, it was interesting to see the reception. The buffets were integrated with the sculptures. There was this contrast between the temporary and the permanent with the presence of the old sculptures. I tried to capture that with my camera. Around 40 of Christoph Brecht's works are being shown at Villa Stuck. His latest one is a video film called La Sosta, or The Stopover. It shows starlings flying south for the winter after making a pit stop in Rome. In retrospect, you can say that my path was very straight. I don't know how things will continue, but I know they'll continue to be exciting because every day brings something new. A very small work is hidden away behind this door on the ground floor in what used to be a closet. It's a video which can only be seen through the keyhole and shows, among other things, St. Peter's Basilica at night. Putting the focus on small things, that's the world of Christoph Brech. 
Well, now we turn to a trend that's been dubbed modern vintage, traditionally crafted products that look like they were made more than 100 years ago. The Feffali Picture Frame Making Company is itself more than a century old, but it's also benefiting from this renewed interest in replicas. It's one of only a handful of firms here in Europe that can reproduce historic frames and age them so perfectly that even an expert might be fooled. The Alte Pinakothek is one of Munich's best-known museums. About 30 frames by Michael Pfeffeler are displayed here. Such as this one, in the style of the 15th century. Few visitors would ever guess it's a replica. I really did think the frame was old. I'm very surprised. The Pfefferle family runs a business making frames in the Bavarian state capital. The company's private collection includes 2,000 original frames, the oldest ones dating back to the 14th century. The company doesn't design picture frames, it copies originals down to the last detail. Such as this replica of a Spanish Baroque frame ordered by an art collector. It's always best to have an original old frame for your picture. But often that's simply not possible, because the frames don't come in the exact size. And if you alter them in any way, then they're no longer original. After the most suitable type of wood has been selected and cut to size, the frame is assembled to scale. Just like the original, this frame is constructed using linden wood and spruce. A wood carver then works on the ornamentation and embellishments. This is the most elaborate and costly step in the production process. All the features of the original frame are reproduced, even the floors. You might assume that they paid close attention to their work. That's not the case at all. I've got a little example here where you can see that they worked in a very relaxed, nonchalant fashion, that they didn't measure everything out precisely. This gives the frame a certain edge, a note of individuality. We try to recreate that in our frame so that it comes across as an original. Then some of the frames are gilded. The gold leaf is just ten thousandth of a millimeter thick and can only be attached with a special tincture. The Spanish Baroque replica is to receive a silver surface. The first step is to take the shine off the metal with a sulfurous solution. Then several coats of paint are applied. Slowly the original tone is recreated. This frame takes eight hours to make. Other, more complicated replicas require up to three months' work. A patina based on a blend of oil and dust provides the final touches. This frame costs 1,800 euros. I think it's really nice. The client didn't want it to look as old as the original, with the paint flaking and all. New or old? The answer is on the back. In the end, it's of course the customer who decides just how old or new his frame should look. I would have personally made it look a bit older. In the silver process, for example, I would have had the silver really flake, just like the original, so that you can see the carved wood beneath. But the customer wanted a more even surface. 
The finished replica is then marked with a wax seal, just like the original frames were in days of yore. Here in Northern Europe, we're at the tail end of a particularly cold grey winter and many of us are slowly going a bit crazy for lack of sun. Springtime is allegedly just around the corner, but if you can't wait, it is possible to fast forward to springtime within Europe by heading south. In our next report, we're going to whisk you off to the Spanish island of Mallorca. It's a beloved destination for sun-hungry German and British tourists who gladly swap their grey days for the splendour of almond blossom time. Locals call these almond blossoms the snow of Majorca. From the end of January until the middle of March, they cast a white blanket across the island. Some have pink blossoms like these. Each spring, five million almond trees blossom on Majorca. The island is popular due to its beaches, its proximity to mainland Europe and its mild climate. Many Mallorcans live from tourism, the island's biggest industry. But February is low season and the mood is relaxed. Still, many people come especially to see the almond blossoms. Some go on guided walking tours. This is the perfect time of year for exploring the island on foot. In summer, it's a bit too hot for hiking. In spring, it's pleasant. You're on the move, so you don't feel cold, and temperatures upwards of 10 degrees Celsius are just perfect. After the long winter we've had, it's good to be back out in nature. Here, everything's green. At home, it's all covered in snow, so it's a nice change. The hikers make the 16-kilometer trek from Can Picafort to Colonia de San Pedro in the northern part of the island. They enjoy a break at one of the centuries-old observation points. They offer splendid views of the almond blossoms. The trees were once an important source of revenue for Mallorca's farmers. But you can't make much money with almonds these days. However, the almond blossom has become a real tourist attraction. Miguel Benito owns Mallorca's only perfume factory. He uses the blossoms to create an almond fragrance. Benito says he finds the scent inspiring. It's a very characteristic scent. I'd say it's most comparable with honey, sweet honey. But it also has a fresh fragrance, a very distinct aroma. Each year, some 200,000 blossoms are gathered for this unique perfume, which can only be bought in Mallorca. Over the years, Miguel Benito has defined his own criteria for the perfect blossom. It needs to have at least five petals. It can't be too big or too small and has to smell good. I like the pink-colored ones best. Workers at the nearby factory decide which blossoms are suitable for the perfume. They check every blossom by hand and sort them according to size. Afterwards, they're stored in a liquid that has an extremely high alcohol content. The precise ingredients are a trade secret. Four years later, the liquid is finally bottled, and every vial contains an almond blossom. Now tourists can literally take a bit of Mallorcan spring home with them. Vacationers who want to get close to nature can stay in one of the island's many fincas, like the four-star Mora Bernau, a converted manor house with almond trees in the garden. Located just outside the village of Campanet in the north of the island, the guest house offers 42 rooms and suites, all furnished in traditional Mallorcan style. 
Whether they choose to relax on the hotel terrace or go on a hike, until the middle of March, visitors can enjoy the other side of Majorca as they bask in the stunning beauty of almond trees in bloom. He's just 42 years old, but already he's something of a design guru. Dutch designer Richard Hutten, born in 1967, says his parents always encouraged him to play. And over the years, he's played his way very successfully into the permanent collections of many a museum. Well, he's best known for his no sign of design furniture, which combines functionality with a very humorous, conceptual style. And some of it is currently on display at the Design Museum in Ghent. Richard Hurton is busy in the Design Museum Ghent, putting the final touches to his exhibition. When it opens, it'll feature 50 works by the Dutch artist. My work is supposed to become uh, part of the daily life of a user. Uh, so the museum is definitely not a goal, but of course it's a great honor to be in a museum. Many of the exhibits are unique. Like this series made of hundreds of books. But Hurton also makes designs for mass production. His prices range between 10 and 50,000 euros. It's, it's different. There are unique pieces, there are limited editions, uh, very strictly limited, and there's mass production. So everybody uh, can find his object depending on his budget. A visit to the artist's studio in Rotterdam. No sign of design was Hutton's motto when he started his career in the early 1990s. So you, can, uh, you can sit like this, uh, relax. You can sit uh, tete a tete with somebody. Every item tells a story. This plate consists of a thousand postage stamps and the thousands of stories behind them. I don't know what beauty is. Uh, uh, Italian designers make these beautiful shapes uh, which try to seduce people. I don't try to seduce people, I try to amuse people. Many consider this sense of irony Hurton's trademark. In his own words, Hurton says he became a designer in order to play with things. Becoming famous just happened along the way. I, I did a, a workshop for my son when he was five years old at school, and then I asked all the kids, who likes to draw? And all the kids were going, yeah, oh, I like to draw. Who likes to uh, make things? Oh, all the kids, yeah. Oh, I like to make things. And then I said, well, that's what I do for a living. And the kids were, huh? Can you make a living out of that? It's... Richard Hurton has achieved worldwide success. In Japan, he's recognized when he walks down the street. But he has no plans to upsize his operation. He prefers to stick with the team he eats lunch with every day. If I wanted, I could enlarge the studio, but my studio is a rock and roll band, and I'm the singer-songwriter. If I enlarge the studio, I will become a conductor, and not part of, of the, 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 the team, not part of the players anymore. And I like to play, I like to have fun, I want to be in the middle. He often draws his inspiration from his home. His girlfriend is also a designer, and his children are good advisors. He says they have a natural feel for clear lines and beauty. He's also exchanged furniture with some of his designer friends. Normally when somebody dies, 90% of what he owns gets thrown out because it's uh, ugly, uh, has no value. I only want to have precious, valuable items which I can share with, which I can take care of. Uh, that you can call uh, beauty, uh, because there is maybe no better word for it, but uh, I call it objects which somehow affect me. And that's exactly the kind of things he wishes to create. At the moment, he's working with books. He spent a long time puzzling over ways of turning them into durable furniture. The book, of course, has many layers, the stories itself. So this is a huge collection of stories, uh, which I turned into my own story, which then uh, becomes the story of the person who buys it. <laughs> the life of a designer. So each 
When you listen to Richard Hurton, you start to wonder if there's anything he can't turn into a work of art. Well, don't forget, you can always review some of our highlights reports on YouTube. And with that, we've reached the end of this edition. So until we meet again from myself and the whole Euromax team here in Berlin, thanks for watching. Alles Gute and auf Wiedersehen.